My name is Laurel Powers Freeling, and uh, I'm an alumna, alumna of the uh, class of 1985, and I'm pleased today to introduce today's speaker, Christian Catalini. Now, Christian is the Fred Kane Career Development Professor of Entrepreneurship and Assistant Professor of Technological Management. He focuses on crowdfunding and online entrepreneurial finance, blockchain technology, digital currencies, and how proximity affects the recombination of ideas, the adoption of technology standards, science, and technology interactions. Christian is here today to discuss how crowdfunding can democratize access to capital and the influence it may have on the rate and direction of innovation in the economy. Now, I have to say at a personal level, I have two interests in this uh, discussion today. First of all, I'm a banker, um, awful as that might be, and uh, uh, therefore have a lot of interest in uh, how capital moves, formation of capital, and changes in, in sources of capital and, and, uh, and funding. Um, but more personally, um, uh, my daughter is uh, a uh, software engineer at a company called Pebble, um, which is one of the companies that we'll be talking about today. When she left MIT, that's where she went out in Palo Alto, California. So uh, without further ado, let me welcome Christian. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Too many slides and we have one hour, so I suggest you just jump in and stop me whenever you see something you're interested in, and we'll try to go kind of faster on the part that you're not. Um, the basic idea of today is to cover how crowdfunding is changing the landscape of early stage finance. Uh, I will give you a little bit of an introduction on, on, on how things are moving in the economy around this. Uh, the basic economics, often they get confused, at least in the press, between reward-based crowdfunding, platforms like Kickstarter, and the equity space, which is actually the, the fastest moving right now. Uh, and then we'll go to this policy question about can crowdfunding really change how capital is allocated in the economy? Are we seeing new ideas being funded because of crowdfunding, or is it just more of the same? Uh, I'll show you some evidence of democratization, and then we'll jump into the equity side and look at uh, online syndication, which is the fastest growing market, at least in the US, <coughs> on the equity side. Um, the Wall Street Journal has been compiling the list of private companies that are worth more than a billion dollars. And again, there's some debate if this list is kind of inflated, uh, if it's partly driven by a bubble, uh, at least from venture capital activity. But it's easy to recognize that a lot of these companies coming up are, are kind of embodying a new wave of technology, a new wave of approaching the economy, um, which often involves peer-to-peer -peer transactions like Airbnb or Dropbox to some extent, uh, Uber for sure. And, and it's easy to kind of forget what is the process behind it. What is it that it's generating all this experimentation in the economy so that every now and then we see some of these major successes. Uh, what's interesting is that actually when you look more at the data, from going from the launch of a startup to a liquidity event, it takes a long time. More than seven years. The 20 something startup founders are the exception. So it's Facebook, the Snapchat, are really the exception to this rule. Often it's enterprise companies that, that get to those valuations. What's fascinating is also that there's, there are some major technology waves. And we see waves of unicorn companies as they've been defined following a major shift in technology and science. Um, 1960s, we have the semiconductor revolution. Later, my personal computers, right? Microsoft and Apple, Cisco in the 80s. Google in the 90s, and now the kind of the LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, and later maybe the Uber, the Airbnb, kind of the sharing economies companies that have been coming up. So this process is actually fairly slow in the aggregate, but we're kind of confused by, by seeing kind of these overnight successes, companies like Snapchat, that, that rose to a very high valuation really quickly. What's interesting is that when you look at the portfolio of your average VC, actually this is a pretty good VC, most of the returns of the portfolio come from companies that are kind of the exception. Uh, they're black swans. When you look at where the costs are, most of the cost and the investment that VCs would do in selecting, nurturing, and mentoring companies go to companies that won't return the capital, so less than 1x. And the few that are kind of the successes, like the WhatsApp for Sequoia, return more than 10 times, uh, sometimes 100 times the original investment. And so the portfolio composition is really skewed. We need kind of a few breakthrough successes to repay the whole portfolio, but most of the investments don't go really anywhere. This is uh, one of my favorite slides. Bessemer actually has it on their website. They call it their anti-portfolio. 
And so when you look at the companies they passed on, many of these are, are kind of household names by today. Uh, it, it's hard to believe that they passed on FedEx seven times. So uh, really convinced about this company not, not being able to grow. Or, or Apple, passing on Apple at a $60 million valuation. That's, uh, that's a pretty bad deal. Um, but to show you some more recent examples, so Fred Wilson, which is actually a great investor, he simply couldn't wrap his head around Airbnb. You see a good team of founders, you see a brilliant idea, but the economics of it were kind of not there. And so they passed on it. And this happens all the time. For investors, it's very hard at the beginning to discriminate between a good idea and, and kind of a breakthrough idea. Average ideas are good to spot, and we have kind of tools for selecting them, but it gets much harder when we're looking at the extreme right tail, those companies that will essentially shape an industry. You can think of entrepreneurship as a process where you start with very high levels of uncertainty, and all we're doing as society, as investors, as entrepreneurs, is throwing time and money at it to reduce that uncertainty. On this graph, where would you want to raise capital? If you were an entrepreneur, you had a good idea, you know there's a lot of uncertainty on the left, less uncertainty on the right, where would you go and find professional investors? Why? Sorry? On the Y axis. At what point in time? So at what point on the X axis? Right? So the Y axis is just plotting the uncertainty. So I see the sign more towards the, the right, right? As farther to the right as you can. Why? <coughs> Why is that important to raise money on the right? Cheaper, better valuation, right? <coughs> so you own more of your idea. But what's the cost? How do you get there? Right, first of all, you need the capital, right? And not everybody may have the capital to go all the way. There's a second cost, which is a little bit more subtle. And That's it's the, the reason why even <laughs> companies that could bootstrap will raise professional capital. Time to market. Time to market, speed, right? And so this is really where early stage capital plays a key role in accelerating growth and in also allowing certain ideas that otherwise couldn't scale to scale. But as we've seen from the previous slides, this process, the way society is doing this, is fairly inefficient. Is it because VCs or venture capital and angels are not good at selecting good ideas? Or is it because it's just the nature of entrepreneurship? What do you think? The fact that you can pass on a Google after having seen their, their early product the early concept, the team behind it, two Stanford dropouts. Why do we keep missing good companies along the way? Risk. Risk diverse. There's a lot of, there's a high degree of risk, right? What else? It's, it's just, uh, you cannot know beforehand what will happen. Right, so, and the class today will, will kind of just oppose two theories. One is that we just don't know, we don't have good information. It's really hard to predict. The information available at the early stage is just too low. The other theory is that our process of selection is broken. That the way we select early stage ideas is a lot of bias. When you look at women entrepreneurs, they have a much harder time funding their ventures. Part of that may be linked to different outcomes and outcome potential, but uh, it, the more likely explanation is that most of the investors are men. And so that introduces bias in the selection process. Minorities. Other ideas that don't come, let's say, from an elite institution like all of you, right? Graduating from MIT. So, yes? Actually, you have another phenomenon that is the claims. If you go to the Silicon system. Valley, you get a lot of money. I, I, I have been involved in, in a couple of initiatives in Miami, and it's really tough to, to raise money because it we is. are out of Miami. The entrepreneurial ecosystem is actually a strategic choice for a startup. Right? If, you're, if you're in biotech and you're in the Kendall area, now you have a number of companies, investors, you have all ecosystem <coughs> working for you. Of course that comes with a price, right? In Silicon Valley, if you're starting to grow, it's really hard to poach employees. It's really hard to keep your employees from Dropbox making them a much better offer. And so there's congestion costs that you need to take into account, but there's also resources. So the ecosystem brings a lot of resources. <coughs> One key, going back to your question about Miami, would be understanding what are some key resources that are present in your ecosystem and not in others. Too often policymakers invest in trying to emulate Silicon Valley, looking like Silicon Valley, but really the key here is understanding what makes that region special <coughs> and where can that region compete on a different dimension than, than Silicon Valley. 
Uh, but when you look around the globe, most policymakers just try to imitate Silicon Valley. And, and what that drives is just not much, right? It's a zero sum game. Um, but going back to the question of funding, here today we'll see a technology that potentially allows anybody, be it in Miami, be it in Alaska, <coughs> be it in India, to access capital at a very low cost over the internet, right? And we've seen a lot of industries being digitized and transformed by the internet. Here is one case where finally we can go online and if you have a good idea, you should be able to be met, like on a dating website, with a good investor. But there's still frictions. And today we'll look at those frictions and where this dream is kind of not realized. Any questions so far? Great. Okay, so let's start from the simple economics of it. We have a whole chapter that I think has been printed out for you. It goes a bit more in detail on this. Why this became interesting? So when we started working with my co-authors at Jay Agarwal and Avi Goldfarb in 2007 on crowdfunding, the phenomenon was very much at the fringe, was at the periphery. In fact, it was very hard to publish our first paper on this topic. Everybody thought that this was a bunch of lunatics on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and you see that it's been growing slowly until the passage of the Jobs Act. That's when everybody woke up and said, OK, this could fund startups. This could fund real entrepreneurship. It's not just arts and crafts online, right? And then there's been a huge hype, huge wave of hype. So you should always, there's, there's always different phases, right, to new topics. That's the phase to run away. That's when everybody's like, okay, this will, this will change everything. Uh, but let's see where it fits. So when you think about early stage capital allocation, we're starting really at zero. Some entrepreneurs will borrow against their credit card. Then maybe they'll borrow against their house. Uh, family and friends, often important in the stages. And then if they're lucky enough to be in an ecosystem that has angels, they'll go to angels. So people that have done this before have, at an exit and, and have some capital to invest. If you're even more lucky, then maybe you have access to the venture capital industry and, and later to, to the bigger rounds, right? So crowdfunding here really starts at zero. You have an idea, you post it online, <coughs> you don't need to borrow money against your credit card. You're trying to assess demand. Does anybody care? Is anybody interested in my product? And we'll get to Pebble in a second, but when Eric was trying to show that a smartwatch was an interesting product, he was actually a graduate from YC, one of the most prestigious accelerators in the country. He had talked to investors, angels, and they all denied him. They didn't think there was a market. People were taking their watches off. They were looking at the time on their smartphone. Right? So that's the kind of idea that traditional channels were unwilling to invest at that point in time. What's happening now is that equity crowdfunding is replacing the bigger rounds. I'll show you data where if you're a small to medium VC fund, you should be worried. If you're a top VC, no. This is actually going to be very positive, and we'll see why. But essentially, what started in the arts is moving towards the mainstream. It may even end up in B2B, B2B solutions. So we'll be able maybe to have suppliers and merchants uh, transact with each other through crowdfunding. So now the utopian view that you've seen maybe in the press is that this will change everything. Fred Wilson said it's going to pour something like $300 billion in the economy. That's a lot of money. Uh, and the World Bank actually recently estimated in the developing countries this market to be almost $100 billion worth. Okay. Especially in places like China where the early stage market for capital are not as developed as in the States. Right? The dystopian view is that this will be a market for fraud. People will lose their savings, the grandmother will invest, and this will be kind of a tulip market, um, and everybody will be worse off. So the truth, as usually, is somewhere in between. So we'll see a little bit of both as we go along. And I'll, I'll try to show you where. Yes? So when you say $100 billion, is it the amount of investments, or is it the market, creation of the market for all the from the outcome? The market in terms of like funding that could could be attracted in, in the first years. Okay. Yeah. So again, people worry about fraud, and I'll show you that actually fraud is very limited. If anything, the main worry, especially in the reward space, is creator incompetence. They have to learn. These are entrepreneurs that are starting. They're new. They're students. Uh, we'll have some data on that. I want to just focus actually on two types of crowdfunding today. The reward base, you've probably all heard of Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And the equity one, where the leading platform right now is AngelList, but there's a number of other players coming in. And I'll show you some early data on, on equity crowdfunding. 
There's other types. Some of you may have donated money through Kiva, right? That's also crowdfunding. There's peer-to-peer -peer lending, which is a huge market. Uh, in fact, the UK is a major government program where they match funds to lower the cost of capital for people that were trying to lend money. And they use a peer-to-peer -peer platform because there, your family and friends will have a very, very good sense if you're, if you're gonna default or not. They have private information about you. And so there's information in those peers, and that's why this technology can be very powerful. But again, today we will focus only on these two, and they have different economics. So it will be important when we switch from one to the other to think about the differences. Often even policymakers, we recently had a round table here at MIT where we brought in the Office of Science and Technology of the White House, the Treasury, and everybody else. They see these two spaces as similar. They're not, they're very different. When we're going from pre-selling a product to selling equity, those are very different products. The amount of asymmetric information that you have is much higher on the startup side. And this is what get, gets everybody excited. Kickstarter has donated more money, allocated and donated more money to the arts than the National Endowments of the Arts since 2012, okay? And so the growth has been exponential. This is about a billion dollars allocated by Kickstarter to different technology products. And as you can tell from the curve, it's, it's accelerating. Now what is less known is that this really started in the arts. This was all about music, um, theater, dance, and small projects. And only recently moved into technology. And in fact, Pebble was the product that defined the technology category. When Pebble was able to raise $10 million on Kickstarter in a few weeks, everybody woke up. It was like, okay, we can fund real businesses through this. Okay? And we'll see what happens. It's important to keep in mind, though, that Pebble is the exception. So projects that raise more than a million dollars, this is kind of the total capital that is allocated on Kickstarter, really account for a small chunk of the money. Most of the money goes to small projects, less than $50,000. And that's what crowdfunding has been really good at. Small projects on a local scale, which have a mix of philanthropy, right? And people are donating to it for different reasons. So now, the ones of you that are kind of in the early stage capital markets will recognize one pattern, which is skewed. These markets are very skewed. When we looked at the first crowdfunding platform, Salaban, 61% of all creators did not raise any money, zero, okay? And 0.7% of them took home 73% of the funds. This is a blockbuster economy. It's a winner take all. A few products are very successful like Pebble, Everybody else has a very hard time raising money because of attention, right? Just when we go on the internet, we have very li limited attention spans and we're not gonna spend hours and hours sorting through products. Now when you translate that to startups, it's gonna be even worse. We need signals of quality to select through the noise. On Kickstarter, again, 10% of the products, 70% of the capital. It's a blockbuster economy. Why do people fund these projects? And here's one example that is actually interesting because the Oculus Rift, which is essentially this goggle for virtual reality, was later acquired by Facebook for $2 billion. And of course, everybody that funded it on Kickstarter didn't earn any return. They were just pre-buying the Oculus, right? That was the contract. And if you look at the distribution of capital, most of the money was going into pre-buying something, 86%. Of course, people will donate a little bit more to support the project sometimes. They will buy some merchandise to support the team. But really, Kickstarter is a pre-selling store. And that's why you're seeing a lot of Fortune 500 moving into Kickstarter to test products and get feedback. It's a cheap way to see, is this gonna be a hit or not? We're gonna put it on, not under our brand name, right? Because that's, that exposes your brand to, uh, to negative feedback if the product is a failure. But essentially what people are doing on Kickstarter, they're lending you money in exchange of a product or a service. <coughs> it could be a theater play a few months later. Okay. Let me go through the example actually. This uh, is Pebble versus Tommy. Uh, so the Pebble watch, which we heard in the introduction, is essentially the first smartwatch, uh, even before the iWatch, Samsung, everybody else. Um, and Tommy, which is this device, I don't have it on today, but essentially you put it on your arm, it allows you to control any device by moving your hands. So you can do a presentation simply by, by essentially moving your hands with that device. Why this example is interesting, it's because the two founders are very similar. So it's almost like a perfect experiment. For the scientists in the room, it's like a treatment and placebo, right? So we have Eric, 
Waterloo Engineer Canada, interested in wearable computing. He goes through YC, the most prestigious accelerator in the state so far. He does a video. He was trying to raise 200K. Okay, when he first launched, all he needed was 200K to develop a small batch and then go back to regular investors and show <coughs> them a more polished product. Now, as a blessing in disguise or a curse, he raised more than $10 million. And so he had to figure out the supply chain and everything on a much larger scale. What's interesting is that Eric, and then they did it again. We'll see the slide. They did it again a few weeks ago. Eric was the most successful Kickstarter campaign ever, right? But he decided to use the platform. So he decided to use Kickstarter, right? The crowdfunding platform to raise his capital. Steven instead, Waterloo engineer, also interested in wearable computing, uh, also goes through YC, so very similar pedigree. He's the most successful YC demo day ever of YC. Of course, YC has had some big successes like Dropbox, Airbnb, but Steven at demo day was the company that had raised the most money with the highest valuation. So very comparable, similar products, but he decides not to go on a Kickstarter platform. He decides to do it on its own website. Can do it, right? You open pre-sales and you take orders. What do you think are the differences? So, first of all, Eric <coughs> raised much more money, ten million dollars for eighty-five thousand units. Steven, and it's a bit more of a niche product, so the watch is something that I guess would appeal to more people. But he sells thirty thousand units, so still a very meaningful number, and raises almost five million dollars. What do you think were the differences between going on Kickstarter and doing it on your own website? And by the way, Kickstarter takes a commission. So between 4 and 5% of what you raise is going straight to the platform. So one basic reason for not doing Kickstarter is like you keep 4% of your money. <coughs> but what else? What do you think could be differences between the two? If you do it on your own website, you get direct contact with the customer and identify who the customers are and follow up with them. Right, so potentially a more direct channel with more information about your customers. Uh, with Kickstarter, you get more exposure, you get featured, basically, if you're... If you're Network your effects, yeah. right? So Kickstarter suddenly puts you in front of many people that never thought about <coughs> buying a smartwatch, right? But they're professional Kickstarters. They are on the platform, they look what's coming up, they care about the community on Kickstarter. So the network effects are much stronger on this platform. And if you're doing well, suddenly you bubble to the top and you have millions of viewers. You'll be featured in every tech review or uh, journal and you'll suddenly be in the spotlight. <coughs> so again, network effects are a key distinguishing feature. But let's think about the drawbacks. What does Eric do that Steven doesn't need to do? So now you're on Kickstarter, your product is visible. What could be a problem with that? If, if you stumble, everyone sees you. It's very visible, right? So you're raising money in a public forum. Every move is known. You can stumble, and OK, that, that, that could really be damaging. But what else? Copy. Somebody Copy, imitation. Copying. Disclosure is a huge problem. Exactly. Right? So when, when Eric went on, the product was delayed. And not, not because they weren't a good team. It's just because it was a complex product. And so entrepreneurs, especially in the first time around at this scale, at issues, okay? Product was delayed, everybody was angry. And he had to post very detailed updates on the first product online, pictures, where they were doing it. Who do you think was reading this, <laughs> right? <laughs> so this was a trove of information for everybody else. Going back to that graph about uncertainty and entrepreneurship, now suddenly Apple, Samsung, Google, everybody had a competitor that was doing the lowering uncertainty process for them in the public. So disclosure is a major concern. Not every idea is a good fit for crowdfunding, especially if you need to disclose key competitive information. All right? So disclosure was an issue, but it also created that brand. Everybody recognizes that the Pebble was the first one. Of course, there's a bunch of mainstream consumer that never heard about Pebble, but at least in the tech space, everybody recognizes that company as being the leader in this space, the, the early mover. The other issue is that Eric didn't have any mentorship. He raised money from an anonymous crowd that put maybe $200, right? So what's their incentive to now spend hours with him, coaching him, mentoring, helping him build the supply chain? None, right? 
What happened here is actually a Boston-based company, another alumni of us, Dragon Innovation. So what they did, they're experts in, in supply chain and bill of materials in China. So they often really deliver 100,000 pebbles in just over a year. He had no clue how to operate at that scale, right? That wasn't his plan. He was planning to produce maybe 500 units. And so here you see really the, the complement coming from the market. This team had developed the Roba at iRobot, so they had the experience to kind of scale something like that. But Steven, from day one, at Spark, one of the top VCs in the city, Intel as a strategic investor, which if you're trying to develop a low power device that needs to do a lot of computation, is, is clearly somebody want to on board. And Li Lao, an angel investor, founder of ATI Technologies, who had gone through the same pain of developing a mainstream product many years earlier with graphic cards, right? And then sold it for a couple billion dollars. So mentorship is something that, that you don't get. What's interesting is that both products, Pebble and DeMaio, try to develop a really strong developer community to create applications, right? Because the watch increases in value, more things you can do with it. The same with DeMaio, more things you can control with it, uh, it can have military application, it can have hospital application where a surgeon is operating, uh, slides and presentations. And so they both did the same moves in this space. Well, what's interesting is that when you look at the reviews, the community on the Pebble side was much stronger. So that early community building exercise on Kickstarter <coughs> developed a product that was much more mainstream, much more visible, much more supported because everybody felt they were <coughs> early adopters but also supporters of this vision of this company. And what's even more fascinating, this is a few weeks ago, so this was uh, March 27th, this was a few hours before it closed, Pebble was able to raise $20 million on Kickstarter a few weeks, actually I think it was a week before Apple made their big announcement about the iWatch, the Apple Watch. Now you tell me one company that can go to professional investors when Apple is moving into a space and raise $20 million. That's going to be a very hard sell, unless you're trying to sell to Google, which these guys, I, I, you may have more information, but they're not aiming for that. They want to build a, a unique product around their idea. And so now you start to see differences between what the crowd will fund and what regular investors will fund. This gave them another runway, $20 million. Moreover, this is non-diluted capital. You just raise money from your customers. That's quite fascinating, right? Your cap table stays clean. Yes. So, so what are these, what are these round of investors? What do they get for that money? So they get the product. So they're pre-buying the, the product. Pre -buying. In this case, it was just, a, I think, about a month in advance because they're starting to ship them now. So two months. Or That's all they get. That's all they get. And this is the reward space. But we'll see in a second that the equity space will look different. Mm -hmm. So here, you're really trying to support a product or idea that you like by pre-buying, by lending money to the entrepreneurs. Yes. I was uh, looking at this, and I think there's an assumption that there's always a, about the product, right? So you're saying even some companies are trying it. What about the market surrounding it? Because there is some things that are very professional, and other yep. things that are like very simple. And uh, some of the simple things are successful, and some are just like bad. So oh, is there any uh, study or any understanding of how the market impacts the the success of the, the product, or so how the presentation better than the marketing, right? How it's presented there, whether you have videos, or how, how does it Very do? important, right? So there's an art of raising money from the crowd. It's <coughs> different than raising money from professional investor. A recent study compared it in a field that's actually very interesting. Uh, in theater, where you have theater experts, right? And then you have the crowd. They looked at projects that were funded on Kickstarter, and projects that NEA experts, so the National Endowments of the Arts, would have rated highly. So it turns out that comparing those two sets, the crowd performed pretty well. They were funding actually more experimental things. They were taking more risks. And so it turned out that of the projects that the expert would have killed, the crowd would have funded a Broadway overnight success. Um, again, the crowd is taking more risk. And part of that is consumption. They're, they just want to go and see the show. <coughs> uh, in this case, most people just want to watch on their wrist. Uh, so they're trying to support the community, but also they want the product. Um, when we looked at kind of the distribution of where the capital is flowing, most of it is pre-selling. Uh, people are just buying. It's not that they're donating money. Some of them are. Uh, and the merchandise is usually overpriced. So if you buy a t-shirt for $50, part of that is philanthropy, right? Um, but what's fascinating is that now you have a system where if you have a good idea, you can scale it up at levels that were 
previously not and imagined were very quickly. Yes? But <clears throat> is this second round really a success or, or is an exception? Because, you know, they have the product. And what they're doing is they're pre-selling one month before shipping. Yeah. Uh, they are paying a commission for doing that. Yeah, they are getting the, you know, the, the PR about that. But it's really <coughs> it is a success or it's just more like a marketing strategy? Marketing is a huge component of Kickstarter, right? So part of this is essentially putting your product in front of thousands of people. It's like a massive focus group. And so is this a success? Well, again, you were a week before Apple would announce their product. And everybody knew it was coming. Everybody had some leaks about the features. And now you're a small player. Where are you going to raise $70 million, right? Of course, investors could just invest in you because they, they hope that Google or somebody else will buy you, right? But in this case, you have a community that really wants to support a different approach to that product, to that solution. They don't want the Apple Watch. They want the Pebble Watch. They want a product that's being created and shaped by the community, and they feel ownership about it. So the economics of it are a bit more different. It's, it's, it's not a peer-to-peer -peer market, but it has some features of that. Um, but I, I totally agree with your point. Part of this was a really well-timed stunt. At the right time, with the right press, when everybody was looking for the Apple Watch, you come out with a new product that's actually competing on many features. It's different on many features and gets a lot of support. When you look at the numbers, I mean, it's not a large number of investors, right, or backers. It's less than 80,000 people. Apple probably sold like millions of watches in the first days. So the scale is not the same. But again, if you have a niche product, you're able to scale it at, in a very reasonable way. You may get to this point, but it's that's kind of an apples and oranges comparison to yep. all this fundraising, because that $20 million, that's just a prepayment on a product. They have to ship out $20, $20 million worth of product minus whatever markups yep. they have. So you can't really compare that with $20 million of VC or Correct. Or but $20 million of VC get also priced on your captive. I'm sorry? You're giving away part of your company when you do that. Here, you're you not do, giving away any. From a cash flow perspective, from a fundraising perspective, Fine. this is money that all, all goes right out the door when they ship that product. They all said traditional investment. So don't think of Kickstarter as a substitute. Think of it as a complement. Kickstarter, so sorry, Pebble, after the first round, they immediately raised professional capital from a Boston VC. What are the advantages at that point? What do you think are the trade offs? Um. So these guys bought basically a product that didn't exist yet, right? So do you have any information at, of what kind of discounts they, they received? For They're getting, a, I think it's about $30 less than the Holy. retail price. Yeah. Wow. So it, it is a meaningful discount. But, but again, here, I, it's important to think about if you show up at a VC and you've sold $10 million of product, lower risk. You're going to get a much better valuation. You're in much better bargaining power than you'd ever been before. <coughs> And these guys, again, they're like, yeah, we need to raise more capital. But look, we went back, and we got 20 million from customers. That's pretty solid traction, right? And there's less capital they need to raise, because they already exactly. have to work in capital. Exactly. So that's right. Yeah, so I, I agree. It's not an apples to apples comparison, but it is changing the dynamics of the fundraising game. Yes. Yeah. So you said that the community field, the, the watch, do they provide feedback for? They provided feedback. In the first iteration, many people started asking for Bluetooth 4, waterproof, and, and a number of other things. And many of those were incorporated. The colors, a lot of that process was kind of engage, used engaging the community. I'll, I'll try to go a little bit faster so that we can cover the equity side, because their things will get even more interesting. Um, again, the chapter you have printed out goes through all the incentives and disincentives. I want to just point out a few. We covered a lot of this, but essentially for entrepreneurs, lower cost of capital, you can raise money on a global scale quickly uh, from people that are potentially dispersed, you get feedback and demand estimation. Of course, you have to disclose and you may crowd out professional investors, right? So that, that could be a cost. Now let's put the investor hat. Well, now if you're an investor and you don't have access to deal flow, but you're good at scouting good products and startups, especially in the equity space, you suddenly have access to early investment opportunities that you didn't have before. And the due diligence performed by the crowd in some cases may work. When a glucose, instant glucose monitoring device went on Indiegogo, it was spotted within a few hours of being a total fraud. The scientists behind it, the patents, nothing was true. So the crowd actually is pretty good at scouting some of those issues. On the other side, these are first time entrepreneurs. So it's not really about fraud, but it's about they're learning, they're new. 
They're by design helping people that couldn't raise from professional investors. So there's going to be delays and there's going to be some failures. It's just part of the entrepreneurial process. <coughs> What's interesting, especially when you look at equity, is that here we're looking at the early stage of the early stage funding. It's super early stage. And so the returns are extremely skewed. If you don't invest in more than 60 startups on a platform like AngelList, you're probably not diversified enough. Because most of these startups will fail and disappear. And so diversification is really important on the <coughs> investor side when we go into the equity space. OK, so let's get to the question about democratization. I'll go a bit quicker on this so that we can cover equity. Um, it's often said that the crowd <coughs> is wise, right? So you may have different information, different preferences, <laughs> right? So if you want to support entrepreneurship uh, by women or by a different minority, like anything that you're interested in, you can support it through crowdfunding in a way that it's meaningful, right? Uh, there's also different rules. So economists like to think about it in terms of market design, how we match the two sides of the market, and this changes the rules of the matching process in a meaningful way. When we looked at the first platform, this is the propensity that anybody would invest, and everybody here was trying to raise $50,000. And you can see that it was increasing really rapidly towards the end. Now what's fascinating is that people that were distant to you, so more than uh, 100 miles away from you, were kind of generating that pattern, and the local people were coming in early and then disappearing. So is this wise or not? What do you think? The distant people are learning from the local people because their perceived risk is going down because the local people may have more information. That's right. So the positive interpretation is that local people may have some private information. The negative interpretation is that everybody's free riding on the signal generated by this local, but this local could have all sorts of motivations. They could be your family and friends, right? Trying to support you. So it turns out that yes, when you split it by people that were socially connected to you, come in early, fade out, and people that were not socially connected to you, they were the ones kind of relying on, on the accumulated capital as a signal. So is this really a global marketplace? It depends how you think about it. But it's clear that people that are socially connected often form a set based on offline information. Everybody else is relying on accumulated capital. That's why the charts, who bubbles to the top, is really important. It's kind of bad news in terms of democratization because some of the frictions that are present in offline markets are ported exactly online in this way. So if you're an entrepreneur in Alaska trying to raise capital, it's not going to be any easier because of your own profit. Because you still need that strong network to get you uh, at the top. And so if you're from Silicon Valley, you probably have access to more capital, to more funding. And we'll see that in the equity game, too. Again, a similar picture. This is the dollars allocated in the arts per capita by Kickstarter. And this is the NEA, so the National Endowments of the Arts. So here we're comparing how a public institution is allocating money <coughs> and how the crowd. And most US states are on the diagonal, which means that the two entities are doing very similar choices. Now, of course, part of this is driven by the fact that a lot of artists are in California and New York. Uh, but even when you control for that, the pattern is still the same. This is in technology, even more skewed and all on the diagonal. Look where California is. This is a log scale, right? So effects are much bigger than they look. But the crowd is not giving capital in a different way than venture capitalists. So when we saw this, is OK, end of the story, no democratization taking place. It's more capital flowing to the usual regions, to the usual suspects, to the usual types of entrepreneurs. But then we plotted this map. And here you're starting to see that, again, a lot of the activity in California and New York, but then you see tech in Minnesota, or like you see fashion in mass. <coughs> not what you would expect. Music in Tennessee, fine, right? But there seems to be something different. And so for a long time, we were trying to understand what is it that is really different. So let me show you some evidence of democratization. Here, you have the top regions in, in technology and film and video. On the left side, in total amounts. On the right side, per capita. Do you see any interesting name on the right column? Anything that stands out? Provo, Boulder, Ithaca. Does that ring a bell? Universities, college students. This is the new demographic that is really taking advantage of this option. 
these are the kind of projects that are defeating the existing economic agglomeration. This is evidence of democratization. But I'll show you something a bit stronger. So this is just a correlation. So regions that have more college students and graduates have more projects and funding in every, in every week and so on. But how do you prove it, right? How do you show that you can drop students from the sky in certain regions and see what happens to crowdfunding? So how do we get a causality here? So then I read this quote by Paul Graham. And he says that it's no coincidence that Microsoft and Facebook both got started in January, a Harvard that is or was reading period when students have no classes to attend because they're supposed to be studying for finance. <laughs> and like, that's, that's the way we're going to prove it. And so we collected data on the holiday break. And here's what happens. These are all the weeks before a college, a focal college is on break. And these are successful and failed projects on Kickstarter. So as you see, there's a huge <coughs> spike at zero. When college students are on break, there's a lot of activity. Now this graph also opens a big puzzle. It took us a few months to figure out. If people are just shifting projects that they would have done anyways, you should see a drop before the break, right? Because now I know that in two weeks I'm going to be on break. I'm just going to postpone that. Same, in the same way, if I've exhausted all my creativity during the break, <coughs> here we should see a dip, right? Because now I need a few weeks to come up with new ideas. And so there should be less projects after the breaks. But it's flat, before and after. So that's what, what that graph is saying is that slack time, so the college break, is causally generating projects. Okay? There's a causal link between having slack time and projects that otherwise you would have never worked on. Now, the literature on slack time, even in, in, in kind of organizations, you can think of Google 20% rule, 3M, a lot of companies have policies for that. It's usually thought about as something for creativity. Right? You, you give people slack, they become creative. Now, it turns out that if this was about creativity, then the projects should be generated during the holiday breaks. We checked that, and it's not true. So it's not about ideation. It turns out that it's all about mundane tasks. Getting your page up, getting your materials, doing some of the fundraising and marketing. Things that students may find even boring or new, and that they don't do during the other weeks. So what this data is showing you two things. First of all, this, this kind of new geographic pattern. But also that what's happening here is that really that we think of slack time in a corporate environment as something targeted at creating new ideas. It's about executing on that. Maybe contacting the person in the other department, getting serious about trying a prototype and things like that. Excuse me. Yes. Can I clarify, what are you actually measuring there? Is, it, is that when they come on to Yes, when they come starter? on. When they post the project. When they post the project. Yeah. And what's interesting is that this is pretty robust. Again, going to the causal interpretation of the mechanism, when the top art and design schools are on break, we see art projects. When the engineers are on break, we see technology <laughs> projects. So you need the right human capital. Not everybody can do it, right? And, and again, most of the spike, it's early in the break, in the first days, in the first weeks. So it's not about ideation. If you need time to ideate, you probably need it a couple of weeks before you launch. But this is all like, pent up creativity that gets released by, by the slack time. Moreover, it's driven by projects on which you've worked for a long time. You've been thinking about these ideas for a long time, but you actually get serious about them during the break, when you have a consistent block of hours um, to work on them. So for those of you that, that have a, a corporate manager on top of you, this is a good point for getting some slack time to work on, on the ideas you've been wanting to work for a long time. Um, and again, here, we exploit a change in Kickstarter in the design of the platform to really show that these breaks are affecting mundane and execution-oriented tasks. So it's not about ideation. I'm happy to talk more about this, but I want to really get to, to this, to the equity side. <coughs> yes? Um, what's, with that spike um, in putting projects on Kickstarter, what's the association with uh, fundraising and then the success of the Yeah, so. One explanation could be that it's just more students funding student projects, right? And so we tested that by using video games. Because we thought, okay, video games should be a category where if this is all about student funding students, we should see a strong effect, no effect. Um, but a lot of these projects don't get funded, right? So a lot of this is really entrepreneurial experimentation, and many of these are early stage projects. 
So only a few of the student projects will really make it. But when you look at the aggregate, sorry, fewer make it during that spike than the other periods? No, the, I, I, there's not a substantial change in the odds. But still, the dynamics of that are that out of 100 projects, maybe one or two are really successes, and a few are kind of average projects. That's just the dynamics of the platform. So these are not lower quality projects than the usual ones. And in fact, we check, they're more likely to have a video. They're more likely to have better product updates. So people are really putting effort into it, and this goes back to kind of the administrative and mundane task explanation, less to the creative one. And you also measured it by the return to the investor. There's no return here, right? So these are all reward-based projects. And so these are like, you know, fund, fund the technology project, fund the artistic projects. But all you get is either a ticket or, or a profit. So this is all Kickstarter. We haven't applied this to equity. Okay. Great, so let's look at equity now. And there's a chapter that you can download here. It's really short, it's 10 pages on online syndication. Um, things are changing really rapidly. The Jobs Act actually was complex. So there were multiple titles, kind of the secret IPO title one, general solicitation. What you hear in the press is always title three. So unaccredited investors getting everybody to invest in startups. And that title hasn't been implemented yet. But what's interesting is actually that under title two, that's the data I will show you today. Accredited investors are really changing the dynamics of investment on these online platforms through crowdfunding. Um, Recently, you may have heard about Title IV, Regulation A+. Plus. That's not likely to affect kind of the iTech and iGrowth companies. It's more targeted at medical devices, biotech, and, and other fields because the amounts are much larger. Uh, regulation is extremely complex. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards about the nuances and failures of our US regulation at this stage. The UK has a much better one. Uh, but what's interesting is that platforms have been smart enough to take Title II and transform it into something very meaningful. Again, it's only accredited investors, so you can think of it about 8.5 million people in the States qualify based, based on network. Um, but it, it is actually generating a lot of traction. So when you think about angel investing, going back to that funnel, it tends to be very geographically localized. Angels spend time with their startups, they select them, they have a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. And so by design, angel investing tends to be play with market failure. A lot of transactions that could be worthwhile never take place. Simply because the angel is not located there. And there's too much information asymmetry. When you evaluate a new startup, it doesn't come with a rating, right? Um, and so what's interesting is that the internet has solved two problems. Discovery, we can match and search, and that's very efficient. And transaction costs have been lowered drastically. One problem that the internet hasn't solved yet properly is this role of face-to-face -face interaction. When an angel is evaluating a startup, they look at them and say, okay, how will this team <coughs> deliver under pressure? What, what are the team dynamics? What is the quality of the founders above and beyond their degree or what we can read on paper? So that's really hard to do on the internet. And that's what angels often do. Uh, and it plays a key role in selecting good startups. Moreover, given the asymmetry, often entrepreneurs are not willing to give up a lot of equity at that stage because they think they have a very good idea. And so that market just breaks. Okay? And a lot of the solutions that you see online, like feedback system, having a strong brand, having a trusted intermediary, don't exist for crowdfunding. There's no rating agency yet. Some companies are trying things like that, but there's nothing like that. Moreover, what's going to be the brand for an entrepreneur that's raising capital for the first time? No brand, right? They're often unknown. So what's interesting is that now we're seeing the emergence of online syndication. And this market design feature is really solving the problems that you see from the offline world. So now an angel that has access to deal flow, or a super angel, can earn a carry, something between 5 and 3%, so this carry is pretty high. The platform takes a cut too, and bring their deals online for the crowd to invest with them on the same terms. What's interesting is that for, for economists, this is great because it aligns incentives. The company, the startup, the investors, and the platform only make money if everybody makes money. If the startup is a failure, nobody earns anything, right? The carry is essentially a percentage of the upside. And that's what we see at stake. <coughs> the interesting feature here is that you don't take a management fee. So when you're, if you're MIT's endowment fund and you're investing through a venture capital firm, you give them a management fee, 2 to 3% every year, and then the carry. 
for handling your money, right? Here, you're just giving them the carrot. So it's, it's all about the carrot. There's much less of a stick. And it's really division of labor, because now if I'm a good angel investor or I'm an expert, let's say, medical devices, I spent like 30 years in the industry, I can go and scout startups and bring them online for the crowd to invest with me. I can monetize on that expertise. Entrepreneurs face a very strong reputation cost now. They don't have a reputation for the crowd, but often the person that will lead the round is somebody that they know pretty personally. That if they, if they mess up, their reputation will be affected in their social network because that's by design the key person that believes in them, right? So let me show you how this is scaling. Here's Joe Pancina, which has a really strong track record as an angel. Uh, he's invested pretty much in everything that, that is sold at uh, very high valuation in the last years. What he's now doing is doing small deals online, about $25,000 $25, per deal, and he's putting only 25K, right? He committed to five deals per year with the crowd. And what's interesting is that now he has 860 people that will automatically invest every time he makes an investment decision. So he's moving with each one of his investments, right? About six million dollars. What's fascinating is that on average people are putting just seven K. Of course there's someone that put much larger amounts, but the average is really small. When you do the math over the life cycle of a regular VC fund, let's say five years, this is like a $30 million a year that you can rotate if you wanted to. You don't take a management fee, but you can take a, a really big chunk of the upside. All standardized online, one person, standardized contracts, you go online, no, no office required, right? So it's all, all you need is your deal flow and your ability to assess deals. And what's fascinating is that that's, that's comparable to $150 million VC fund. One person online, blockbuster economy, right? Another example. Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss, I mean, is known for his book and his audience on the blog, but in terms of being an early stage investor, most of his reputation is coming from being an early investor in Uber. So is he a good scout? We don't know. Uh, and again, similar dynamics, he has more than a thousand people <coughs> that want to follow him and follow his investment decisions. Like this is Twitter for investment, essentially. Um, and, and if one of these deals goes well, he's going to earn a lot of money. I mean, he's going to be diluted eventually, but 25% carry is, is, is really our number, right? <coughs> What's more interesting is that now you have people like Lee Jacobs. He has a strong network in the valley, much smaller scale than the two people I've shown you, but he's originally from Brazil. And capital is much less distributed equally than ideas. There's good ideas everywhere, it's just that capital is unevenly distributed geographically. Going back to your case about Miami, there's some really good startups there, but it's much harder for them to access capital than if they were based in the Bay Area. And so what he's doing is going back to Brazil, scouting startups, and syndicating them online on AngelList. He has, uh, this is outdated, but essentially he probably has about 30 to 40 investors, and he's starting to move capital comparable to a small seed fund. So when you think about a lot of the policies that are implemented by governments, to encourage entrepreneurship or regional entrepreneurship. Here you have one person with a strong network that is scaling that network online and delivering much better results than, than a lot of other policy interventions. So can I ask a question? Yes. Out of ignorance, but sincere, the, the boards and governance of these, does, that, does he? He probably gets a board. He's, he gets a board, but then in year five, right. he's on 30 boards. What happens then? Does it like catch on fire and burn? Right. So, honestly, this is the early stage chunk of it. Professional investor usually follow on after. So, this is almost like the angel and super angel stage that now gets the crowd involved. Moreover, I should have specified that the crowd doesn't get a share of the cap table. They invest in a fund that then invest in this vehicle. So the cap table stays clean. Uh, so that's a key difference when it comes to governance. Yes. Money is coming from the crowd. So what is the mechanism for this getting 50% scale? It's in the contract. So if the startup is acquired or exits, he's going to take the carry. Like a VC. Very much like a VC. Do you have any data that VCs are sh uh, they shy away from companies that uh, are... They don't. And I'll show you in a second. Okay. So I, I go rather quickly because we're running out of time and I'll <coughs> show you the last result. But essentially this company <coughs> raised $6 million. Brazilian company in an online classroom. And only 8% came from Brazil, so a tiny share. 
Uh, this is the growth. So when AngelList was doing direct investment, it was growing much slower. Once they introduced the syndicate feature that really lowers asymmetric information, the growth ex it became much more similar to the one you saw for Kickstarter. It's exponential growth. So this feature where you have somebody curating the deals is extremely valuable. Because otherwise it's very hard to invest in startups online. There's follow-ons by top VCs. VCs like this. This is just a better funnel, especially if you're a top VC. You're getting more deals, you're getting more experimentation, and then you can invest, right? Moreover, often some of these angels are very good network with VC. So if you're a top VC, there's nothing to worry about. But if you're not adding a lot of value, now you need to worry because the capital part of your job is being replaced, commoditized, right? It's all about deal flow, mentorship, and all the added value services that some of these VC do. So here, just a couple of points, and, and I think we can share the slides with you so that you'll have them. Uh, but when you look at the top syndicates, it's extremely skewed. Moreover, the investors are all visible in high profile consumer-facing ventures because that, that's what builds that <coughs> reputation. So now if you're an expert in, in B2B, it may be harder to build a very strong syndicate. It's kind of the trade-offs. Moreover, at this point, they're all based from, they're pretty much all from Silicon Valley, San Francisco, right? So it's very geographically concentrated. This is the, the last graph I wanted to show you, which is again about democratization. So if you're not a startup from the Bali, what happens when you introduce syndication, 78% of the capital comes from the Valley. So if you believe that the Silicon Valley right now is the strongest mentorship and capital for high growth startups, at least in the tech space, this is good news, right? So if you're based not in Silicon Valley, you can access that capital. Almost all of it comes from there. Assuming you have a lead that is known to the Silicon Valley investors, right? Now that's, that's bad news on two fronts. First of all, most of the leads are from Silicon Valley. And so that democratization is not happening yet, at least on a large scale. Moreover, when you compare these two columns, which shows you kind of the non-Silicon Valley-based investors being able to enter the Silicon Valley deals, they're actually much better off when there's not a lead involved. Because the lead is a market maker. And so we'll select both the startups, but also then which investors to bring in whenever the deal is oversubscribed. And so you're starting to see that if you're in a region that has a really strong and, and productive angel network, this is great news. You can scale up your deals, you can access capital from the crowd. But if you don't, now you're even more isolated. I'll, I'll kind of skip the, the whole opportunities and risk on this. I want to show you one last thing. So it's kind of interesting because we started with reward-based crowdfunding, and then we moved into equity. And here's a hybrid, Indiegogo, which is the second largest equity crowdfunding, uh, um, reward-based crowdfunding platform, started a syndicate on an equity-based platform. How does it work? So essentially, they're selecting the best projects that bubble up to the top in the reward space. So they're saying, thank you, Crowd, for allowing us to select the best projects. Now we're going to go and do an equity round on our own. And we're going to earn a carry of it. So the signal that you generated will be useful for us to select good companies that then we can scale even further. So you see these two models are starting to blend in a very meaningful way. And BlueSmart is actually MIT Sloan alumni group. Uh, the team is, is out of Sloan. Uh, they were the first, the first deal that was syndicated this way. I cannot show you the, the capital amounts because I'm not sure everybody's an accredited investor in this room, but they did pretty well. Um, so, Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions, both online and offline, according to, to the time period. Thank you. Do you have time for a few questions? Or? I think so. Great. So the Jobs Act was going to kind of bring all these different options available, including Title III, which you mentioned, which is crowdfunding to, for equity for everybody. Right. And, and so far, they have chosen not to do that. Is this something we think the SEC will actually get around to doing at some point, or are they just? At some point, they'll have to because uh, I mean it's being delayed in, in a meaningful way. But one note on Title Three, right? So do we really want everybody to be able to invest in this early stage start? Well, the returns one are thing to be able to gamble their money in the lottery. Or the Fair enough. I think what would be more meaningful on the unaccredited investors will be like intermediate products where you can diversify. Let's say you invest in a fund that then invest in startups. Um, because you really need 50, 60, 80 startups to <coughs> properly diversified on, on, on angels. And so most people would just invest in a startup 
run by their friends and, and lose their capital. So I think on that front, the SEC is doing the right thing on protecting investors. But like you point out, they're also excluding them from you know the next Uber potentially. And so is that right or wrong? Um, it depends on the context. So I think with good investor education, uh, right now our accreditation standards are based on network, but that's probably not the best method, right? So if you're someone which has an MBA, uh, they probably are, are better than many accredited investors evaluating deals, or if you have a background in finance or in law. Like, there's, I think, different fields where you can select uh, startups. So we'll see how that evolves. Uh, what I find more fascinating is that often people will talk about this as disrupting VC. It's not. In fact, it's, it's actually complementary to the top VCs that do a lot of mentorship, that have good networks, that connect founders, and disrupting in the medium to lower level. If you're a VC that is just surviving because you have preferential access to capital, this is bad news. Capital is gonna be a commodity. Uh, I did my PhD in Toronto, and there you have, uh, without mentioning any funds, there's a few VC funds that are funded actually by government money, and the preferential access there is just access to government money. And so if that's all you're doing as a VC, then this is a big trap. But if, what I think is more fascinating, it could be very interesting for everyone here in the room, is that all of you have very deep expertise in your vertical, in your industry, accumulated over many years. And so you're probably in a much better spot than spot good startups in that space than, than your average VC fund. But right now, for you, there's no way to monetize that. What I've shown you with syndication is it's a method for monetizing that. You can go online, you earn a carry, so you're paid by performance. All you need is like you know your name, your reputation, port it online, and a network. Um, what that means is that I think this will democratize expertise. And so if you're a machine <coughs> learning expert, you'll be, it's not that the VC will invite you and offer you a nice bottle of wine and a check at the end of the year, you may be able to get 1%, 2% of, of a big startup. But what's your standard of care from a liability perspective? Yeah. Your reputation. That, that's well, less for this. Well, what is your standard of care from a financial liability perspective? serving in the student syndicate role. Can you be sued for that? Potentially. Well, what is your standard of diligence? Who monitors that standard of diligence? Every other, every other fundraising activity yep. going on in this country is heavily regulated. Right. The trend is not less regulation, it's more. <laughs> so how, how can you come in here, not be regulated, just use your reputation, and willy-nilly allocate capital? No, I, I agree, and that goes back to Title III, right? So these are accredited investors, and accredited investor can already do this offline. So it's no different. If I trust an angel, I see. right? Um, so it's a big boy. It's it's a big boy uh, yeah. exemption from liability. It's five or six feet. Yeah. So it's been around for many years. Uh, I think what's fascinating though is that we think of regulation always as reactive or as monitoring. Here you have information in the social graph and the social network that emerges through this. Uh, platform. So when Joe Pancina goes online, yes, he has $6 million for each deal, but he has a huge reputation. He has a lot to lose, right? And so moreover, all of his life is tied to selecting good deals. Uh, and that's the kind of person that you want. Um, so is that reputation stronger than checks and balances on the finance and accounting? I, I'm sure we'll see some drastic failures. We'll see companies disappear, money disappear. And that's where I think the SEC being actually cautious on the unaccredited is wise. Because uh, it, it's a bit of a far west. Okay, I see a lot of questions. We may, you, you'll tell me when we're out of time. Yeah, I mean, if somebody needs to leave, I think it's probably okay. But yeah. if you want to stay, here's your questions. When you said all you need is the upflow and the education, <coughs> experience, practice, et cetera, and the network, but I thought that the online syndication is what builds the network of investors. Bring a network to Not a really, right? Because uh, I went quickly, but in that graph between local investor and distant investors, it was kind of the same dynamic. You need like a strong bootstrap from your original network to get your attention. Because there's thousands of, like even now, there's like more than 100 syndicates on AngelList, and only the top ones are really raising that kind of capital. So <coughs> if you go down even 10 syndicates, you're down in 100, 500K range. Uh, so you need that network to bootstrap and validate yourself. Um, to get is it just AngelList dominating? Or they just doing so satellite? AngelList is dominating the space of high growth and kind of the, the Ubers of the, the, that kind of model. Um, there's other platform that I take, actually uh, one of our alumni uh, has taken a different approach and they, they, they want money from everybody. So they're a bit more broad, less growth company based, <coughs> companies that will return maybe three, four, six X, uh, which there's nothing wrong with, it's just a different type of investment vehicle. But if you're thinking about, you know, 
Silicon Valley or Kendall Square based startups or New York based startups, that's, that's kind of the model that's, 